Hi, everyone. I'm Tatiana Morrell, the Director of Workforce Solutions at YouTube. I was asked what I do to inspire inclusion. To me, inclusion is about creating a work environment where everyone feels welcome, respected, and valued. It's about ensuring that everybody has an opportunity to, to succeed, regardless of their background, identity, or beliefs. One way that I try to inspire inclusion is to start with hiring. Make sure that you have inclusive language in the job description, push your recruiters to bring you a diverse set of candidates, and when interviewing, ask all candidates what they personally have done to promote inclusion in the workplace. I find it's very telling on how they respond to those questions of if they are also open to inclusion. Have a great rest of your day. Women leaders are really growing in the WFM function. I see that, you know, like good number of growth in terms of, uh, you know, the profession growth. And also we're seeing that a lot of leaders are taking the leadership level and global leadership level and also uh, getting into the, you know, the business role and taking the driver's seat to drive the business and drive the industries. They've been really creating a lot of value to the industry, to the business and also to the community. So to conduct this round table, you know, we have very influential uh, person, uh, Melissa. Melissa doesn't need much introduction. She has been known in the global market, that in WFM and uh, customer experience and founder secondary industries. She is pretty well known and uh, she comes with uh, more than two decades of experience and spent good amount of time in contact center industries and also in IT industries where uh, she's been one of the influencers where she has uh, uh, been leading and she has mentored a lot of global leaders and uh, she would have got more than 100 to you know like 500 uh, leaders was got mentoring and also coaching and also like advice from melissa melissa is a senior vice president and global wfm head of uh, survey support service group she based out of us great to have you melissa with us and uh, we're all excited to listen to you and also like you know to have a conversation with uh, all the uh, uh, eminent uh, speakers Tasha, you know, Vanessa, Catherine, Subold, Francia, and uh, Aida. We are a great team. You know, we are going to really have uh, great discussions and uh, we're going to draw great takeaways in this process. Thank you so much for taking your time out to uh, share your thoughts and insights. We are so privileged. Over to you. With this, I welcome Melissa to take over and uh, she's going to moderate and uh, she's going to chair the Women Leadership Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shiver. Thank you for continuing to empower us uh, across all of our fields and have such a good voice. Um, <clears throat> I always have to tone out uh, during your introductions because I am always humbled by your words and I'm always so grateful to be here. And that's kind of why where I wanted to start today's journey as I talk about this roundtable. So, you know, as I envision the journey that we're on, we're, we're in front of a big, dense forest, right? And this big, dense forest that we're in as we journey through in our leadership, like some path has been cleared for us that we have to respect. And when I hear you introduce me or when other leaders on this call feel the same way, when I started my career, I, I can't even remember the time. When, when is the start of your career? Is that your first job? You know, making sodas at a restaurant, maybe, or <clears throat> is it when you got out of college, or is it when you forged into a contact center? But none of us probably walked into our career thinking we would be forging a way for women leaders. I certainly did not. Um, I was just trying to survive. I was trying to be myself in a world that didn't quite recognize me as myself. I <clears throat> had many journeys through this forest where I was mirroring other leaders that I thought I was supposed to look like. I was looking at my male counterparts and said, should I act like that? Is that who I'm supposed to be to be a leader? And, you know, I was graced with many inspiring leaders in my career. <clears throat> I was also graced with leaders that were not inspiring that I was like, I don't want to mirror that activity. But the point was, I didn't start this journey to be someone that someone looked up to as a leader. Um, and I looked, I thought about 
the leaders ahead of me. And, you know, I opened today's session with Aretha Franklin Respect, which was one of the panelist recommendations, which was like such a trailblazing part of our journey as going into these roles. And then we ourselves, it's a humbling responsibility that we have, that people put trust and faith in us to continue this journey. Um, and we still have frustrating obstacles. Like sometimes I think we've come so far <clears throat> and we've cleared so much of this brush out of the way and we think we're laying down pavement. And all of a sudden we've run into people that you're like, wait, have I gone back 30 years? Can you look at me in my eyes? Can you respond to my questions? Um, but then in those times where I feel I run into those obstacles, I'm so again empowered by how far we've come. The fact that we can call it out now, that we don't have to sit quietly and that we can embrace all forms of diversity in our workplaces. And so as we start this session today and, I, and we get to hear from all these leaders, I am humbled at the responsibility on my shoulders and I embrace it. And I know all the leaders here do today. And we have gratitude, we I have so much gratitude and there's so much unity in what we do throughout our industries. And when we get this time together to just sit together in this space and talk about the things that inspire us, the things that have gotten us where we are, um, I am so grateful for this time. So I wanna jump right in to make sure we have plenty of time for our panelists today. So I want, what I would like with some introductions, just, just kind of introduce yourself uh, in as few or as many words as you need, because we really want to get to know you today. And then just tell us about some personal experiences where you've been part of the transformation of gender roles um, that celebrate diverse leadership in your organization or your past organizations. We've all come from different paths. And I love to take the moment just to get to know each of you and then we'll dive into today's content. So I'm just gonna start at the top left of my screen because it's easier that way. So Vanessa. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Vanessa Nicholson. Um, I have been part of the WFM community for probably far longer than I want to admit. Um, 20, almost 25 years, I think. But um, you know, as Melissa was doing her uh, introductory statements, I was kind of thinking of my my first roles and, you know, sort of how I progressed into leadership over the years and, but you know, how you, your, your first steps are often, you know, in very, very junior roles and you don't think about yourself at that point in your career, you're not going, Oh, Hey, I'm, you know, what, what skills do I need to acquire to become a leader sometimes? And I think particularly with women, you know, a lot of it kind of uh, develops organically over time versus with specific intent. Um, and actually, the story that came to mind, Melissa, as you were, were talking there, is uh, in my first role in the contact center world, um, I sat, ne yet sat next to a very young man who was very brave, um, you know, and, and very early on in his career put up his hand and, you know, at, he wanted to be a team manager at that point. And I remember sitting there going, I don't think this guy's a leader, like, but he was brave enough to ask for it. Whereas, you know, I reflect on that young woman sitting in the chair next to him. And, you know, I wouldn't have had the courage at that point to go, hey, I think I have these skills. I think I have something to offer. I developed a little bit more of that courage, you know, over the years and learned from watching peers, uh, learned from watching men, uh, learned from watching women who did have the courage to speak up and advocate and provide, you know, fantastic influence uh, to me in my career. I think this conversation is, um, continues to be relevant, um, you know, and particularly, I think that these conversations can help us empower confidence and inspire our, our, our network in order to perhaps look at things a little bit differently. Um, I, I think that, you know, from, you know, and again, we've got a, a very diverse and multicultural group here, you know, from all different cultures around the world. And, um, I think that in all of them, the, there can be common undertones of, you know, it can be different for women um, as they pursue leadership opportunities. And sometimes we have to lean into it a little bit differently. Um, so I think, you know, as we go through some of the intended questions and, and topics that I, I see, I think you're going to hear a lot of stories um, that will resonate with you and that will, um, you know, sort of 
help look at things differently. And, you know, in terms of how you champion um, and, and really sort of drive change within organizations and with, you know, inspire other women, this is a workforce management forum. You know, this is a world dominated by numbers, but all of those numbers reflect people. They reflect our, they reflect our clients. They reflect um, employees who have real lives. And, you know, women can be really, really powerful storytellers and help bring those numbers come to life. Um, and, you know, I'm a mother, I am a caregiver for my aging, uh, my aging parents. Um, you know, I am a leader in a corporate world. I'm all kinds of things. And, you know, really the way that I champion and try to inspire other people who may be looking into leadership is by allowing my whole self to come to work. Um, you know, being candid in conversations and, you know, I have my perfect days. I have my perfectly imperfect days and I try to bring both of those through. Right. And, um, you know, I think that allows people to have that confidence to recognize and bring those full self to work. And that's, you know, how I try to lead into championing a space where, you know, diverse experiences can be perceived or allowed or celebrated in a leadership space. Thank you, Vanessa. That's beautifully said. I, I, one of the things that you pointed out that I never thought of as a particularly, um, woman trait, but I think you're right. The ability to story, be storytellers, right? To really make people understand, like connecting your empathy to what's going on with your numbers and what that means. I always say I'm the master of analogies, right? But it's really the ability to tell a story. Well said. Tasha, how about you? I was waiting patiently to introduce myself. I think I'm the only one sitting here that's out in South Africa. Um, and I am so glad that I'm able to represent our young, powerful and future leaders that sit in, um, sit in Africa. I think just a bit about myself. Firstly, I'm 28 years old, similar to Vanessa. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a sister and uh, a mother to, <laughs> to many of, of those that report into me and that I've been able to lead now and in the past. Um, if I look back 10 years ago when I was just, getting into my career, I sat down as an agent and I was making sales and I was like, okay, this was, this is a fun thing to do. Um, I knew nothing about the contact center industry. And then I had an opportunity to go into workforce planning, not knowing what it is at all. And when I, when I look at where I am now, being able to influence, support, mentor, and empower other people around me, I just go, wow, Tash, how did you do it? I don't know the answer to that. Just by the way. Um, and I think just like many of us, we, we move so fast and so quickly through our lives and our careers that we just don't take a second to reflect. It's such a difficult thing to do for us. I think as, as women, I think it's a difficult thing for us to do because we're always so used to taking care of everyone else and being that support structure to everyone else that we don't have enough time to self-reflect. So I am very big on Women's Day. And when I when Shiva uh, reached out to me, I jumped at this opportunity to um, be part of this panel and sit alongside some powerful women in the industry, individual, um, in-house, BPO contact center, uh, corporate sector to just share and influence others around us. And all these hearts and congratulations that's coming through is actually from my team, my friends, my family out here in South Africa. And I think the one takeaway as much as this is the third year I'm, I'm doing this and the one takeaway that I always go back with is what an experience and how beautiful it is to look at insights of other individuals that don't often story tell don't often get to share their insights and you think oh you're in this whole you know you're in this industry alone and only you're experiencing those hardships and only you experience those hurdles but I think it's moments like this when we come together, we influence, we learn, and we we take away things that can help us. Um, and I think today I'm here to do a bit of both. I'm here to influence, empower, and support, and I'm also here to learn and take it back. So, Melissa, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> a little a little dynamite sort of intro, but I think I'll leave the rest for um, for the session to come. Uh, absolutely incredible. It's it's so great to, I, I think many of us there can look back to that point in our careers and boy, if I was where you were when I was um, where you are in life, I'm so impressed with you. And it, it's so much that I think as women, we don't talk about. We, we talk about showing up to work and being there in that moment against 
standing next to the people who don't have the responsibilities we have at home. And the fact that you're a new mother and you're so deep into this leadership journey already, so amazing to spend this time with you today. Um, all right. Well, Aida, we would love to get to know you a little more. Hi, Melissa. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have to start by saying that um, I'm so happy to be on a panel with Tasha and so impressed. I think it's absolutely fantastic in this forum, particularly with some of us who are a little bit older than you, Tasha, uh, to see somebody who at 28 has a career, has a new baby and is having it all and saying there's no reason I can't have it all. And uh, I think just your presence here is an empowering message um, and a really positive message to young women. So kudos to you. I'm I'm excited to be on the same panel as you. Um, about myself, um, my name is Aida Costello. I'm based in Cork in Ireland. And I actually spent a lot of my career working in high tech manufacturing industries before I transitioned to um, workforce management in the BPO industry. So um, I started in the BPO industry as a planner um, and that's how I came to workforce. I started as a planner in manufacturing um, and thought, oh, well, I'm a planner in manufacturing, I'm a planner. So, you know, I can be a planner somewhere else. Um, and a little bit like you, Tasha, when I got into workforce management, I dived into it, not knowing a lot about it um, and quickly discovered discovered that I loved it because what one of the things I really love about workforce management is that interaction between numbers and human behavior and that storytelling element of our our jobs. So that's something that, that really excited me and that I continue to enjoy. Um, I've with TELUS International for seven years now um, and I've been a director of workforce management here for just over three years. Um, I started as a director, regional director for Europe with responsibility for three countries at the time. Um, TELUS International is an extremely dynamic organization and a very exciting place to work. So at this stage, three years on, um, I still have regional responsibility for Europe, which is now 11 countries. And I also lead um, three of our strategic global clients. So very excited to be here today and get this chance to connect with other female leaders in the same industry. Mm. And full disclosure, I have to say, I'm absolutely thrilled to be on a panel that's moderated by Melissa because Melissa is a former manager of mine and it's wonderful to get an opportunity to connect with her again. So thanks, Melissa. And thank you, Dr. Shiver, for the invitation. Thank you. My uh I, I would used to love my one-on-ones with Aida every week. I always felt like it was a counseling session for both of us. So um, I think your ability to connect with p people and your grace and leadership has uh, been amazing to experience in the few years I've known you or the many years I've known you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Looking forward to hearing thank your you, insights. Uh, Sue. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, and again, thank you very much for the invitation today, Dr. Shiva, to come and come speak with you. This esteemed group um, of, of women leaders in the, in the industry. Um, very similar stories to you guys in terms of where I've been and what where, where I am now is, 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 is a slightly different to you. Um, started off in a contact centre as a very young 18-year-old in the north of England. Um, and yeah, went into an industry, kind of part-time work, fell I don't know whether the community in the sense of community that contact centre gave me as a, as, a, as a young person. And during that time in the northeast of England, actually, the, the, there was some strong women leaders who were head of the contact centres, head of the head of the regions and ones that I still speak with now and who are very much have been part of my journey as a leader and trying to emulate what they did and how strong they were. And again, in a very different time in the late 90s. Um, so, yeah, I think it, the, the importance of today for me really is um, I think we're on a we're on a big trajectory at the moment and, and it's moving quicker and quicker every time. Every every International Women's Day coming around, I feel like it's getting bigger and there's a more momentum around it. Um, but what I think is really good about this global setting that we're in at the moment is, is to be able to be consistent 
our out messaging is the consistency that we've all got the same belief ultimately, and I think it will move quick more quicker if we if we we're sending out that same message together across every culture across every country and every region. So I think this is why I, I feel that this this forum is is extremely important um, to to maintain as well. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I'm really interested in how the conversation moves. Excellent. It's great to meet you, Sue. And I agree. One of the things that um, you said I, I think is powerful is like how we move across cultures is so important. And I've had the uh, extreme pleasure to manage in 19 different countries at this point in my career. And I always ask leaders, like specifically, what's unique? Now, what is it like for you to be a female leader? Because in some cultures, being a woman leader means you're really sending a message out that you don't want to be married or have a kid or be in a family like it's it's still in yeah, some yeah. cultures this or that one of the other isn't it yeah yeah so I, I think it's important that we know as we interact with women across the world where their countries are in their journey and help them through where they are um, so it's a very powerful point that was very eye-opening to me as I've crossed over the world to just ask very openly you know what it means for them to have a family or mm -hmm. Um, come to work every day and how the culture sees them. It's a great point. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, um, you know, my journey at the moment, I mean, you know, I'm in the vendor space and I've been working with with um, um, a, a big sales organization for many years now in a, a very male oriented tech sector. I've got to be honest, I've come from a contact center, which I, I think is a little bit more even um, in diversity. Um, but moving into a tech sector where I believe it's it's something like 95% um, male male dominated um, is is a is is a big shift and it's getting better it's getting much better but going back to that culture there's a very different feel across different regions um, and again being a mother and, and my my daughter's um, just well nearly ten next month um, again moving the last decade and how quickly this has moved on um, you know and being able to take that time off and having that. Um, the security that that's not really going to have the effect as it once did many many times many many decades ago perhaps you know when when um well certainly when my mother was was off bringing us up as, as young children it's very different scenes you had to kind of make big decisions and i think we've taken that that risk and that's given people that security to be able to make those choices again yeah absolutely thank you catherine hey my turn now hi everyone I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity. And by the way, I was just thinking that I got this opportunity thanks to my global leader, who is a man <laughs> and definitely really open to expose and, and give opportunities to his female leaders um, to raise their voice and, and um, uh, be part of such initiative. So... Um, I'm I'm French. I'm based in Paris, and I have uh, spent almost the past twenty last years working uh, and and taking my career in the tech and IT services world. So hence, I am quite used to navigate into organizations that are global organizations and mainly. Uh, male, um, driven by men, led by men um, at all levels of the organization, right? So that's that's uh, where I come from and where I am working. Um, I I am a mother of uh, three daughters, and um, it resonates a lot uh, what Sue, Tasha, and all those fantastic ladies have just commented because for me. Uh, being a, a mother of three daughters um, means a lot because it drives my philosophy and, and my career because I always want to act as a role model, thinking about my girls in anything I am doing and accomplishing every day. And for me, uh, it's really uh, about the transmission and giving them the confidence that they can do everything they want and that they can be anyone they want. It's a matter of individual and personal journey. Um, 
each woman has her personal choices. And um, for me, it's not a matter of um, highlighting or having a conversation around, are you planning to have a family or is it important for you? For me, it's obvious that it's not a matter of questioning this, right? It's a personal choice and you need to get the same chance, whatever you want to do. But my philosophy in the life is that uh, I will never compromise on my work-life balance because I deserve to have everything. It's not a matter of making a choice at some point. Either do I want to have a family or do I want to have a career? We can have both and we can do both. So... Um, I'm happy that we have Tasha here because, again, she is representing the next generation of future leaders, and I'm at the other side of the <laughs> of the mirror when I can look start looking backwards. And you know, we can do we can have both, and and that's really the the message I, I would like to share today. That is so important to me. Thank you, Catherine. I think it's and it it's funny. I would, similar journey for me because I had two boys. And I raised my boys in the view of a strong career woman, right? And I think about how they are now as young men. Um, uh, one is 22 and one is 32. And who they're around and, and how they've been influenced by that journey. And I think it's, it's important that we mirror that for all of our children. I know uh, everyone on this panel, I think, are, are mothers or at very least have uh, young people in their life to mirror. And I think it's so important that as we all make that choice, um, I had my children very young, so I still had that path. And some people as they're older, but it's it just changes the order, but it is a journey that we're all on. Yes. And it is good that we get to chose. Excellent, thank you. And, and by the way, um, I could never have thought about having a career, having three uh, kids without having a fantastic man alongside to me who is taking part of the of everything, right? And and giving me the opportunities as well. So I think that at some point it's important to mention as well, right? Men are part of our lives, whatever it's in personal life, professional lives. And it's also um through the education, through um the 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 the, the the people we have around us that we can build our careers, I would say, but without uh, my husband and, and being the, the man he is, I probably would never have this opportunity neither, right? So it's just to mention that it's not only a matter of, of women building by themselves and for themselves, right? It's an environment and ecosystem that you need to build around you in order to put yourself in a successful path whatever, it's a personal, a professional, but you never can do that alone by yourself, right? In isolation. Absolutely. Good point. Francia. Hi, Melissa. And thank you, GWFM and Dr. Shiva for strongly advocating and supporting women leadership in WFM and also for you know hosting uh, this year's leadership uh, roundtable for women leaders. Uh, to everyone on the call, my name is Francia. I'm based in the Philippines uh, with 20 years in the BPO contact center industry. I'm currently the head of customer service center in Mandalife, and I'm also the executive chair of Global Women's Alliance in Mandalife. Um, my career has always been an open book <laughs> from my modest beginnings in a male-dominated industry to stepping up as a female leader battling stereotypes and workplace aggression, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and women empowerment has been my strongest and longest advocacies in the workplace. Over the years, I've seen many great individuals who rise and break the bar barriers, just as I have followed those who guided me or my mentors or women mentors who guided me throughout my career. Now, as a leader, I... Pay it forward by granting others 
the same platform to showcase their utmost potential as women leaders. As an executive chair or sponsor for Global Women's Alliance in Manalife, I am privileged in a purpose-driven activities, ERG or Employee Relations Group that is really engaged in creating that fellow uh, that that empowerment for women leaders in the organization who share the same passion. Um, I also run you know speaking engagement for both inside and outside of our company with the same purpose of inspiring others to do the same, discussing topics uh, particularly around women leadership and women empowerment. So I also get to listen to stories of other people, learn from their victories, learn from their failures, and which I really enjoy, uh, enjoy most because that's where I can grow further as a leader. So for today's topic, I'm really excited to learn from the other women's on, women leaders on this call. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to meet you. You're in one of my favorite places on the planet. I was just there last month uh, and always love spending time there. So as we dive in today, so a couple things for those of you listening, <clears throat> please, if you have questions, add those to the chat. Um, so as we have time, uh, I'd love to pull those in as well. But today, as we uh, talk to the panel, looking forward to talking about what they're most passionate about. So I'll just jump right in. <clears throat> and this question is for you, Vanessa. Oh, I'm sorry, not Vanessa, but Catherine. It's for you, Catherine. I apologize. Uh, can you share a specific example of how your leadership style has empowered your team? You know, whether it be a success for a project or initiative or, or your overall organization, what style do you bring that you think has been most empowering? So first, um, I would describe my leadership style as uh, always being um, empathetic and giving opportunities uh, to expose my young, talented female team members to senior leaders of the organization. Um, and that uh, I have a, 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 a recent example to illustrate my purpose. So very recently, our Europe CEO um, has mandated me to run a huge um, project around workforce management transformation uh, for Europe. So Europe meaning uh, 20, 20 plus countries, okay, across the geos. And um, our Europe CEO is the exec sponsor, and I had to build a team in order to, to manage and lead this program. So what I did is that I ensured from the very beginning that I would not go with the simplest way to build a team, meaning bringing the most senior experienced experts in their domain to be part of this initiative. I always ensure that I bring and I build part of the team with young, more junior, talented uh, female professionals so that they can get this opportunity to be part of something that will bring them the self-confidence that they can be part of something big, even if they are junior, and ensure that they have an opportunity to get exposed during meetings, presentations, um, actions plans to executive senior leaders, right? Um, and this, this, in my view, is super important because one, it's a way of... Um, ensuring that young professionals project themselves and are convinced that they can build a career within the organization. Second, uh, it brings a lot of diversity, energy, and experience to the group. So we are always learning from each other, taking back from each other, and so on. And it also gives a, a accountability and responsibility to the most senior leaders 
to embark and um, develop and grow as one team those young professionals. So that's the way I, I used to to create uh, and embark and and um, experience my leadership style. Does that answer your question, Lenisa? Yeah, and I think it's so important that we give young leaders a voice and get them used to being heard. Because I will tell you, when they're not, they'll know the difference. And I'll, you know, I've had those situations where I've had amazing leaders that empowered me who love to ask me when I said I couldn't do something. But why? But why not? But why can't you do that? Why can't you do that? And and I had that great experience. But then after the empowerment, I encountered people who wanted to silence my voice. And I knew the difference. And by knowing that difference, I was able to stand in my confidence and go, no, I'm sorry, that is what I meant. No, you, you don't let the passive aggressive comments go past you like you used to think was normal. So I think it's so great that as we show young leaders what it looks like to be empowered when they're not around us, when they go their own way and forge their own career, we gave them that moment to understand what respectful leadership looked like. So thank you for that. So, um, you know, as we look forward into this, and so my next question is, as a leader in the, within an organization, think about diversity as a whole and not just around just women diversity. Obviously there are many diverse groups uh, in an organization. How do you actively promote diversity and inclusion within your teams and your organizations? And do you have strategies for that? So Tosh, I would like to take that to you because being the young leader you are, you know, how do you actively promote diversity? You know, Melissa, in my time, the last four years to be exact, I've led a department of close to 90 people before departing of that um before departing of that chapter, moving on to my to my current chapter, which is a lot more strategic, a lot more uh, administrative, and also very people focused and, and and looking on toward. But if I can just reflect on my time on where diversity needed to come in play, not just diversity but inclusion, it was when I was when I was leading that group of ninety people. I had different skin color traditional background, cultural background, you know, call it what you must. I've, I've had the, the delight of getting more experience by dealing with that diverse culture where the, the at, right at the top before anything else comes respect. If you're able to forefront any relationship bound by work, profession, um, personal, if you put respect at the forefront of that, you will immediately see people flourish. They will come to you naturally. They will just take to your natural tone of life just because you're able to respect their boundaries and respect their parameters on how they operate as an individual. And you probably think, oh, 28 year old Tash, how did you know? How do you know that? It took a lot of, lot of work to get to that point where you're stopped thinking of, because I think. You know, what we misunderstand is that that boundary or that line in the sand that you have between managing people and leading people. I think when you manage people, you have an expectation and you're like, right, this is my expectation and go and run with it. And you're not allowing anyone to think beyond your ability. But as a leader, you allow people to use their own discretion, use their own character, their own personality to deliver on it. But that's where you as a leader strategy comes into play. You need to identify your key players and who can execute a role based on the project you're working on or the piece of work you need to deliver. And I used to engage, and I still do, engage quite often with the people element to understand and break down those barriers that hold them back. And, you know, being in workforce management, it's all about the number, you know, that's the that's the theme of it. You go and you speak to someone in the operational team or someone else in the business, they're like, oh, no, 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 you're just the person that deals with the numbers, right? But we have a workforce sitting behind us that we need to empower, educate, use to our discretion to help drive that number. 
And the only way you're going to get someone to drive that number is if you are able to interact with that person and allow them to be inclusive of what you're doing and allow them to shine through their barriers and their parameters. Um, I've been bound by the boardroom where, because, you know, I went through most of my career hiding my age, just by the way, right? Because the first thing is like, oh, no, you're the baby in the room. You don't have much experience to share, so let Let's hang on with you and let's go around the table this way. And then eventually when it came to my turn, it was like, okay, meet, books closed, meetings over. Thank you very much. Everybody be on their way kind of thing. I've come from that. So most of my career, um, I acted with an aura that demonstrated that I was way older than I needed to be. I, I don't know what a 21-year-old Tash was meant to be because I think I was a 35-year-old Tash at 21. Um, and I was determined. I was determined to be heard. I was determined to voice my opinion. And what I lacked was courage. And I, I was able to enable and teach others to use their courage, but not my own. I actually just learned that recently. I was very skilled and scripted in the way I operated as a leader when I was dealing with my peers and my counterparts. But when I was dealing with my people, I broke down that wall I entirely broke down that barrier and they got to experience the true Tash. They got to experience the 21-year-old Tash that was ahead of planning and that needed to deliver a result. So the only way that I, my, my sort of coping mechanism was, if you want to be heard, allow others to hear you. And then if you want to hear others, let them speak. Know what you're dealing with know how you can make them inclusive. I've dealt with personalities that felt they weren't fit to be there. They weren't fit to do the job. They became resistant to change. And resistance always comes with conflict. There's a reason. There's a there's something underlying uh, behind that resistance. And I think because out here in South Africa, um, you know, Melissa, at the start, you said, you know, you get the norms. You need to, the women need, need to be in the kitchen. They need to be at home. I'm a South African Indian. And back in the day with my, my grandparents, that was a thing. The woman was at home. The woman never worked. So I am an absolute culture shock for most of my family at the minute, to be fair, right? But I think when you have those stigmas attached to you and you come come to work with those stigmas attached to you, it's such a it's such a difficult thing you as an individual need to work on because then you got Tash saying, sorry, you need to work on this. Forget about it. Be stronger. Be bolder. Speak up. This person's coming from an environment where they were taught to be hush. Speak when you're spoken to. And I think the inclusion part, the inclusion part comes in when you start with your respect factor something that's not that person or that the, your team, your whoever it is that you're coaching, you're developing, or you're trying to drive, you break that barrier first with your respect. And then you see them attract to you and show them your true self. And that's how I've operated in, in the world where being diverse and trying to be inclusive was unheard of. It was difficult to come by. Um, and I'm talking from a point where our... Uh, workforce management 10 years ago was a male dominating field in South Africa, in Durban specifically, male dominating field. You get one out of 10 women that you'd find in a leadership role. So I've fast forwarded that and that can kind of tell a little bit of the story about why I, I was not heard in the boardroom initially and hiding my age. But if you fast forward to where, where we are now and the, the, the world we want to create for our people, it doesn't matter if you, if you, if you can't, um, if you can't present in front of a in front of a panel, doesn't matter if you can't um, go out there and you know speak to hundreds of people and tell them your vision and tell them who you are. But if you can do it in your little world where you're included and you're a strategic or a tactical, you're an analyst. Allow that person to be an analyst. If that person's a leader and can speak out and can go for it, use that person to go and do, do the tough stuff, the tough conversations. But I think most of the time, managers create those bounds and we create those parameters because it's about what we want, not what we're trying to do for the next person. So 
that's my view on the diversity and how I've been able to kind of maneuver. Around. I haven't I haven't found the formula to, or fix yet, but that's how I've been able to maneuver around those challenges in my sort of experience over the, over the years. Excellent. No, I think it, and I, I think it's important to recognize when we talk about diversity for us, for those of us in analytical fields, we deal most of our employees, most of our rock stars are neurodivergent, right? They are they are brilliant, brilliant minds that aren't necessarily really good at speaking up. So I think it's so important that we find their strengths and allow them to flourish in the way they're comfortable and find their career paths. And I, I love to ask questions of people. What do you like doing most in the day? Like they want to, you know, if you're someone who wants to hyper focus and fixates on numbers, let me put you in that place to be successful, but also give you the opportunity to grow. So I think that's a great point. All right. So um, Sue, I have a question for you. Uh, in your leadership role in your organization, what challenges have you encountered as a woman leader and how did you navigate them to drive positive and change? as you've advanced your career? Um, I think for me, um, I've kind of been in a leadership role now for just slightly under 10 years. And so I was in my early 30s when I became quite, quite a prominent leader within the tech sector because of, I was the only one. Um, and I kind of got a massive sense of imposter syndrome in any meetings, in any 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 just presentations to you know upper management in terms of what I was doing and how I was doing and how I was performing I felt that I always had to almost overachieve and I felt like it was a little bit harder on myself in terms of what I needed to do and prove myself at that level and this is nothing to do with the guys that were sitting around the table with us this is, this is all innate in the way I've kind of not been brought up but just the sense of you know the time in which I was I was kind of had a career and and where I came from um, so I was really quite hard on myself, I think, initially in terms of when I moved into a leadership role about what I had to do. And I, again, it, you know, trying to be a mother and everything at the same time. And it was really difficult. Um, but what I learned is that actually I didn't have to do that. I, I didn't have to be, I didn't have to sweat every time there was going to be some, you know, I was going to be in a meeting and I had to, I had to deliver a, maybe a bad news story because I always felt like that was when I was, the, you know, the worst. But just because I was a woman, is that going to be, more difficult for me to deliver than if I was a man delivering it. Do they still get the same stresses that I do? Maybe I, I don't know. Um, so I think from from what I've learned is to to kind of step back from situations and really understand that it's regardless of gender, regardless of diversity, regardless of whatever it is, everyone has a personal journey and performance, um, and everyone should be have a right to be at the table, and should no one should have that. Well, if you do actually, imposter syndrome has got to two sides for me one is if you have got it potentially you're pushing the boundaries and you should be there but secondly is not don't feel it consistently right once you're there you're there um but so this, this it has got two sides for me but what i have learned is that if you're not in your comfort zone then you're, you're definitely making strides forward um and trying to encourage people within my team i've got a very diverse team as well i've got a 50 50 split which i'm very proud of in the tech sector for, for, uh, for men and women um and to to be at the table and be confident um, and not feel that you have to overprove if you're a woman. I think that's the key message that, that I give my team. So, you know, I'm curious and I will thought because when we talk about imposter syndrome, obviously it impacts everyone, not just us. But I find myself and I wonder if, if you've had the situation to where I can be, depending on who around me and the feedback I'm getting, the most confident bold person in the room. I'm able to speak with strength and go, but all of a sudden I'm faced with one type of personality. And when they shut me down, I'm shut down. And it's so funny in years and years of leadership, how I can step back from that. Like maybe the next day I'm like, why did that bring up that imposter syndrome so strongly in that moment? Can you give us any tips on how to overcome when you're in that moment and all of a sudden you go from speaking with strength and confidence and knowing to, I feel like I'm lost again. Have you ever had that situation or anyone on the panel of how you yeah. overcome those moments? I, th I think um, feeling that sense of not, not were my answers are not worthy of what they wanted to hear. And sometimes I think stick to your guns, 
what you're saying is right and don't change their answer because that's not what they want to hear. And I think that's, I, I know exactly what you mean. And it's almost like you feel like someone's trying to trip you up, but they're not. They may be just asking you a question, but you feel that, have I said the right thing? Should I change what I've just said? And I think now, again, growing into the role and being being in, being in leadership role for, for a number of years now, you, I have got the confidence to know I'm, I am right. That's, this is this is this is my answer, and this is what I'm I'm sticking with, and this is how we should move forward. See, so absolutely, that that questioning yourself is just take a step back, have a breath. No, I know this. I know my stuff. I'm the expert. I've been here a time, and so if this is this isn't a fluke. I know what I'm talking about and have confidence in yourself to move forward with the same answer. Try not to adapt to be like, try not to be a pleaser all of the time. Yeah. Great, great advice. And Melissa, you. were you, uh, did you get exposed? There was a above the line, below the line video that ran around corporate circles four or five, maybe four years ago. Did you ever no. see it? I'll, I'll share the link with you all. But um, it's a fantastic demonstration of, um, really when people get kind of triggered into fight or flight and what you just described is that scenario where you know you, you're, you're in you're going if you're above the line you've got a growth mindset you've got resilience you're good and sometimes what can happen if in, and it can just be the nuance of a question the way it's phrased or whatnot but it can it can pull you below the line and it can trigger you into kind of fight or flight and usually what's happened is the way that the question's been phrased or whatnot, it has you doubting sort of your core. It's challenging the person versus the idea, or there's something that has just changed the dynamic of the conversation from somewhere where, you know, pure business, pure confidence to wait a second. Now I'm personally associated to it, or I feel personally challenged. And I find that myself in those situations, it is when I, I feel like there's a doubt or questioning about me personally, that I start to feel threatened. You know, I, I'm in WFM. I love to debate with passion. You know, yeah, yeah. you know, challenge my ideas, bring it. But when anything in, you know, even that slightest inflection that it's challenging the person, not the idea, I find that it, it can kind of change your the way you respond to challenge. So I'll share the video. It's a, a fantastic. It's only a couple minutes, but. I've, I've read a, f a few things recently. I've listened to a few podcasts and it's about, you know, management um, uh, podcasts and things like that. And one of the key messages of what I've listened to recently is this, don't take anything personally. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, it's such it's such an easy sentence to say. And I was, I was like, wow, it was a bit of a moment. I thought, no, I shouldn't take everything personally. I mean, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. I'm doing a really good job. But why Why do I, as a similar say, why am I kind of triggered by something someone's just said mm -hmm. weird isn't it yeah I think agree you know I find something so I find this so close to me because I have to often check myself and bring myself back from this imposter syndrome Melissa but it happened to me for like five seconds because people confuse your passion with defensiveness and I'll be okay. like no, no 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 I'm just trying to give you facts I'm just, I'm stating the fact and I'm I'm telling you my experience with dealing with this historically. I'm not getting defensive that I don't know how to change the result. I'm telling you what you need to do to change the result. And then they go, oh, there we go. You're going to get No, no, I'm just passionate about what I do. I know what I do. I'm experienced. I'm skilled. I've been through it. So I think because we're in, we're in such a tricky place, um, being in workforce management, it's easily associated with that we're not people people are orientated or we don't know how to articulate ourselves or we're all about the numbers. I would be rich for the amount of times I've heard that in my career. And every time I went and sat down into a meeting that I'm all about the numbers. Um, I think, Melissa, that imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome hits us when we no longer feel intimidated by the content and we start becoming intimidated by the personality trying to attack us indirectly. Absolutely. Great, great feedback, guys. And I, I think it's I think it's important to recognize, too, how we've changed over the course of our career. Um, I had a leader mentor once. She wasn't a leader. She was actually it wasn't at work. She was just a mentor in my life. And when I was very young in my career, you'd have those emotional conversations with aggression, which that's what triggers me. And I would tear up at work. Right. Those those moments where we're we're young and we're like, oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm and I remember she said she was a leader at her organization. She goes. When I get that way, I just explain in the meeting, I'm very passionate about this. So if you see tears, I'm not upset, I'm passionate. It's just the way my body releases that passion. 
own it. And I was like, yeah. I'm like, you can say that at work? She goes, absolutely. That's just, own that's it. my yeah. own. Yeah. Um, all right. So thank you so much. So kind of moving on, um, I know as speakers, a lot of you are passionate about this. Um, reflecting on your journey within your organization, how has mentorship contributed to your professional growth? And how do you yourself approach mentoring within the organizational context? So I'll start with Vanessa for this one. So th this is a subject near and dear to my heart, um, you know, and I, I've leveraged it pretty much through all phases in my career, whether or not I realized it or not. Um, I would say it's probably more recently that I've been more intentional about it instead of sort of happenstance as I was earlier on in my career. Um, but, you know, my first leadership opportunity was, in fact, from a mentor and, um, you know, a, a mentor who uh, provided a new opportunity for me, um, oddly enough, as I was returning from a maternity leave, which in Canada is a big thing because we're off for a year. So it's very rare to be off for a year and come back and, and, and have a, a career progression opportunity in your life. Um, you know, and I, I almost, you know, I think back to the imposter syndrome of coming back into that and having your first real leadership opportunity being when you've been out of the corporate world for a, a, a year and you, you, you left with deep subject matter expertise and you're coming back. You've been with an infant for a year and all of a sudden, you know, you're in this position where you're going to be leading, you know, adult humans and, and, and working through that. Um, but again, it was mentorship and that kind of connection that created that opportunity. But there's also, um, you know, sort of a, a second element of that is that not only was she was a men mentor, but she acted as a sponsor. And I, I think that that's something that I really want to kind of call out to this audience is that I think as, you know, um, women tend to be very, very focused on connection. And I think we need, tend to lean into the ideas of mentorship very, very naturally. Um, the idea of sponsorship, though, is perhaps something a little bit different. So having a sponsor is somebody who will advocate for your growth when you're not in the room, who will look for opportunities, who will um, challenge you and speak up for your capabilities, but also identify, um, you know, the, the, the development opportunities that you have, but help you get that next experience to get that experience to develop that capability to challenge you to push you. Um, but having somebody who will act as an active sponsor for you, it's something that you often have to ask for. Sometimes it happens organically. Um, but you know, again, sort of talk, you know, to, at the top of the call, I kind of talked about that, you know, that kid next to me in the call center who had the bravery to put up his hand and go, Hey, I want to be a leader. Let me be a leader. Never would have done that. I would have wanted to pick every box first, but he had the courage to do it. And having the courage to ask your network to sponsor you and to promote you to to put you in opportunities of challenge, to make your name part of that conversation. It takes a certain amount of um, intention uh, that sometimes we don't, you know, again, like I, I can go on about mentorship for hours and I won't. Um, but, you know, it, that idea of asking for a sponsor is also, I think, incredibly powerful in a career. Back to mentorship just for a second, and I don't want to take up too much real estate on, on, on the call, Melissa, but, um, you know, as I said, it's something that, you know, I didn't even realize that I was doing early on in my career. It's probably only in the last five or 10 years that I realized how strongly I leverage it um, in a reciprocal way. Um, so I tend to have a very, very large uh, group of people that I meet with, um, you know, to provide mentorship and to receive it. Um, but, um, you know, it really is sort of, you know, all sort of levels. I, I you know, I, I, I will, you know, have reciprocal mentorship relationships that go up. Um, I, de I, you know, if I'm exposed to somebody who's more junior in their career and that I have that opportunity to be able to have exposure and to take them under my wing, I do. Um, and I really do. I appreciate a diversity in my mentorship relationship, men, women, uh, BIPOC. Like I, I really, you know, really try to make sure that I'm not just connecting with people who have similar experiences to myself and it makes me stronger. Very recently, um, I took a couple of years out of having like large team and um, I really I only had two direct reports. I was in an IT space surrounded by men and I missed having a team. I missed having, um, you know, that really being a, a part of my core function at a day-to-day -day level. So I leaned into mentorship with intention. 
you know, I knew that I was missing that part of my day, you know, as a people leader, you know, that is when I am in that direct leadership position, that is the time of my day where I have the most confidence. You know, so project complexity aside, I know that when I walk into a one-on-one with one of my directs, that, you know, that is where I am my strongest. I can be whatever they need to be. I'm very flexible. Um, you know, I don't have any self-doubt. And, you know, I, I've got a consistent history of people telling me that, you know, that is where I shine. So when I suddenly didn't have that as part of my core function, and I was in and more of more of an indiv- individual uh, contributor role surrounded by men, I actually had to go out with intention and make sure that I boosted up how many people I was in, you know, mentoring circles with. And, you know, ostensibly, it's to help them, but really, it was helping me um, and making sure that I was sort of feeling that sense of self fulfillment and being able to help coach them. So you know, kind of in summary is just, you know, I think you, even if you don't, you don't think you're doing it, you probably are. Um, but, uh, you know, if you can go into it with intention, try to diversify the connections that you have. Don't just seek out people who, you know, have similar experiences to yourself, but chase that diversity. Um, but also have the courage to ask for sponsorship. And, you know, sometimes that might push you uh, to go outside your comfort zone to ask for somebody who may be, you know, again, it could be that leader that you had a little bit of spark with, but didn't work directly with, you know, have that courage to ask for advocacy and and support, um, you know, and it's not always in just your closest network, you may have to go, go beyond. Excellent. I love the idea of sponsorship. Now that I, now that you've given it to me, I'm like, oh yeah, they were my sponsors, not my mentors. I will challenge everyone in this moment on mentorship. And I want to hear from a few more of you on this. It's so critical because I'm at this stage of my career right now that you get mentor, you you're involved in mentorship outside of just your organization, like organizations like this or others. And I'll tell you why, when, if you choose to leave your organization at any time, which I recently did about six months ago, I left a seven year deeply connected career where I had a thousand WFM professionals and personally connected to the mentorship of many of them. Um, So moving organizations, of course, you're reestablishing those quickly, but that is a huge switch of mature mentoring relationships versus new ones. And new ones take a lot more get to know you time and mature ones feed both ways. Like my mature mentoring relationships where I was mentoring people, they also mentor me. So I encourage those of you who are passionate about mentoring, make sure you don't stay single threaded. I still have the people I mentored in my lives, uh, though I've left the organization. One of them is in this call, but it's still different. It's not that day to day. So keep that going uh, as you do mentorship. So speaking of mentorship, Aida, what can you tell us a little bit about your journey on how mentorship has contributed? <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. And I think you know how passionately I feel about this. And I think you probably know some of the things that I'm going to say. Um, so let me let me start with a quote, actually. Um, Abraham Lincoln once said, I am the success I am today because I had a friend who believed in me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. And I don't for a second put myself in the same category as Abraham Lincoln. I'm not completely delusional. But that was very much my experience. Um, When I came to the organization that I'm in now, I had been in the same company for 14 years previous to that. So um, I have two daughters. They're grown up now, actually. The youngest one of them is the same age as Tasha, which makes me feel ancient, but that's a problem I'll deal with later (laughs) Um, in my own time. So um, I worked all throughout their lives. From when they were babies, I never stopped working. I always worked. But I did um, I did work in an organization where I had a very secure job. Um, I loved my job. I had great colleagues. But there was a very flat management structure and very little potential for career development. And I evaluated and took a decision that actually the role that I was in and the company that I was in suited where I was in my life at that time and where my daughters were in their lives at that time. So I continued to work, but very much put my career on pause and in second place to my family. And then 
my eldest daughter graduated college and started working. And I found that I was a little bit envious of her and what she was doing and the strides she was making and the experience she was she was having. So I sat back and I thought, OK, do I continue in my comfort zone and the path I'm on? I'm well happy. I work with very good friends. And I decided, no, if if I don't make a move now, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And I'm always going to wonder what could have been. And after 14 years, it was a big decision. I, I have to admit that before I even did my CV, before I even sent out a, one single CV, um, I spent about six months deliberating, doing a draft, finding reasons to stay. Um, and it really was a big jump for me to move. And I think largely because of the fact that I almost felt I didn't deserve to change my mind and really push my career. I definitely did have that imposter syndrome. And I came in, I'm not going to say meek, I don't think I've ever been meek in my life, but lacking somewhat in confidence. And I met a phenomenal mentor, um, a very wise man in my company. And we just clicked. Like from the very first time we met, we just clicked. We had that automatic connection. And from the minute we met, he mentored me and he championed me. And at some stage, I kind of started to see myself through his eyes. And I liked his view of me an awful lot better than I liked my own view of myself. And the person that he saw was an awful lot more capable than the person that I saw. Um, there were val more values in her experiences, both inside and outside work, than what I saw. And a lot of the things that were part of my life experience that I thought, you know, were just everybody has these life experiences. They don't they don't have any bearing on my work. He helped me to see that I was bringing things as a result of my life experience that did have value to the organization, that did have value in a work context. And that that changed the trajectory of my career. And it also made me really passionate about paying it forward. And what I've learned as I've mentored other people in the organization is I probably learn as much from being a mentor to others as I learned from being mentored by more experienced people than myself. Um, and we had a, a great experience this year in my organization. One of my young female leaders in the organization came to me and said, we need mentorship. We need mentorship by WFM for WFM. And I said, OK, great. I'll support it. Bring me your ideas. And we collaborated and we put a mentorship program together, which was really successful. It ran for almost six months. And we really put a lot of focus into the planning of that mentorship program. And one of the things we really paid a lot of attention to was matching the mentors and the mentees to really try and, you know, from the experience we had of the different people to match the personalities that would be compatible, that would challenge each other, that we knew could learn from each other. Because that's that's the thing about mentorship is you can plan it as much as you want. But mentorship is a deep relationship. So unless there's a genuine connection, you won't be successful. So sometimes that's the challenge is finding that that deep connection. But it's it's something that I hope to continue benefiting from in my career because I've, I've had some phenomenal mentors that I've learned from, including Miss Johnson. Um, and I hope to to continue to learn from people who who you meet in that space where they have the freedom to not be politically correct, to kick your backside if you need it, to give you a bit of a shake, um, and where you have the space to, to say things like, I really feel like an imposter today. I'm, I'm really feeling stressed today. I'm having issues with today. The things that you feel you can't say very often in a work form that you have this person with whom you have that connection and you feel you're in a safe space to say those things and be receptive to somebody saying, you know, sometimes what you're saying is BS and and call you out on that. 
Thank you, Aida. What I find fascinating about your story, Aida, is I get to see it from all sides. So the gentleman that she's referring to mentored me about 15 years prior to meeting Aida. When he wasn't even my boss, he was someone who just saw me from another organization, later came to work for me. And then I got to hear the other side of the conversations where he sponsored, Vanessa's word, for Aida to me for her roles. And it reminds me of like that generational power that we experience as parents in our lives. That generational power as we hold our children and our grandchildren is the same you get through mentorship. Like you can see people's careers nurture and be nurtured. And it's such a two-way street, three-way, four-way, and it grows exponentially. So I think this is why so many of you are passionate about this topic is we've gotten to see it um, from both sides. You get so, sometimes so much more out of mentoring someone than being mentored sometimes. And it's very powerful. Uh, Francia, can I, I know this is something that you're passionate about as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how mentorship has contributed to your growth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, lo looking back on my journey, mentorship has played a significant role in my professional growth. Um, having mentors who provided guidance, support, and valuable insight has really helped me to navigate um, you know, challenges, uh, help me develop new skills. They helped me reach my career go goals. Um, and to pay it forward and support others, now that I'm supporting a large team, I approach mentoring with you know, a similar mindset with what um, the others mentioned earlier. Uh, I wanted to highlight five things I, I usually approach, right? the, the, the things that I usually apply every time I mentor. Um, I start first with the core, which is active listening. You know, I take <clears throat> I take the time to listen to, to their goals, to listen to their challenges, uh, understand their aspirations, and provide a safe space for them to share their thoughts and concern. Um, the second one for me is, you know, sharing experience. I always draw from own experience, success, and failures to provide practical advice and guidance that can help our mentors or our mentees in their own journey. Um, next that I wanted to highlight, which I find very important, is offering encouragement. Um, by offering encouragement, motivation, and helping them build that confidence and resilience so that they can work towards their goal. Um, Providing feedback is another one. I, I find it very important, particularly if we offer constructive feedback and we guide our mentees to help them identify areas for their growth, areas for their opportunities, ways they can improve their skills so that they can achieve their full potential. And lastly, it's really creating opportunities. Um, I know we're all women leaders here. I think it's very important that we help identify uh, our mentees, um, pursue their opportunities for learning, pursue opportunities for development and advancement within the organization. I'm very proud to say that in my team, I always give equal opportunity for female leaders to lead big team, big organization within Manulife. And by adapting a culture of mentorship and support, I have seen, you know, my mentees grow professionally. I've seen them achieve their goals. They become great leaders in other organizations. And, and for me, mentoring is not just about sharing knowledge. It's about investing in, their, in others, fostering growth, and building strong and supportive community. Thank you. You know, I, when I think about that mentoring relationship, there's something that we don't, really focus on in the workspace, which is what we're uniquely qualified for. And when I say that, think about your personal life. Those of you have had very different journeys. I had a child when I was very young as a teenager. That makes me uniquely qualified to mentor women in those situations. Some of you have had other journeys in your life of uh, where you went, where you traveled to, some of the things that your children went through, your spouses, your, your marital journey, your every your work journey, that unique qualification makes us our personal best humans. And it's that part of ourselves that we have to bring into our mentoring relationships. So I always challenge to find the thing that you're uniquely qualified for. The thing that 
you went through that many pin, people didn't? And who in your life needs that mentorship in that moment? And it really goes beyond work to how we mentor other women. Um, and I've said this many times in many women's forums. I used to say when I was um, a young mom and you guys, Tasha, particularly might remember the chaos of a young mom. A chaos of a young mom working is there's always a pile of clean laundry on your love seat that you haven't quite gotten to put away yet. There's always the stuff you shove into the corner that you can't put away, that you're so overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day duties. I used to tell women, stop putting them away when other women are coming over. You're not helping them on their journey to appear perfect. You're not mentoring them by hiding all your laundry when they walk in the door. If you really want to mentor other women, let them see you where you are. Let them see the mess. Let them see what you're uniquely qualified to offer them. And don't try to be that perfect person that you're not. Because all it does is create that unrealistic expectation on all of us. And so I'm very grateful of your view of that, that particular approach. But it really brought to life like our unique experiences, how they pull us into mentorship. It's quite... Uh, it's a quite an important journey for us. I'm going to go to a question that we have uh, someone asked of us in our open forum, and I'll just open it up. Um, we are all already successful leaders, but what are you doing to ensure you continue to grow in development? How do you maintain consistency? Um, and what are your principles? So I'll just open that up. Does anyone want particularly passionate about that question that came from the forum? I actually responded to it, um, oh. Melissa, as well. But just to maybe put more life into it, I think, you know, I, I mentioned on my answer that when I was in, and I spent the better part of my life and career investing in my work. I'm so meticulous in what I deliver because I feel like I've got a point to prove, but not to anyone else, but to myself. I've got a point to prove to myself that they, you thought you couldn't do it, but look, at, look here now. You actually can. So there's no excuses. There's no excuses for a poor delivery. There's no excuses for you not being able to wake up and get to work. There's no excuses for you sending out an email that had grammar all over the place. So, and that's just a personal thing for me because I think I personally am very hard on myself. I know this as an individual. I'm just built like that. That's like a built-in function that I have. But what keeps me grounded and what keeps me driving consistency is that I always ask for feedback, even to my staff. I'm like, give me feedback. I was a little bit of a douche today, wasn't I? Give me feedback on it. Challenge me. Tell me where it is that I can change. Tell me what it is that I can do to support you better. Maybe my, my method's not working. Maybe my method is, being, is, is proving me wrong this time. And it's about being open to take that feedback, but not sitting with it. It's what you do to act on it and improve and reassess yourself, reassess your position. That's me as a leader. When I was an analyst, I would sit with a checkpoint list because we, we, we've all been there when we needed to deliver a forecast and we needed to present that trends analysis on why we didn't meet performance, right? We all like to do that. So I used to have like a list, a checkpoint on exactly what it is I need to do and what's the key message I wanna pull across. And I do that with every piece of work not just a piece of work I needed to deliver but I used to create like like a governance like a standard operating pack for myself that I would say okay Tash this is what you need to do and this is how you're gonna you're gonna get it done and I built almost like a memory box I've got books and books and books and my staff will laugh at me if, and they're already clapping here I literally pulled out a stack of books and I stole them my bible I call it my bible Every day and as I go through my work, I'll be writing down stuff, key stuff that I've learned, key stuff that I need to remember. And I've stored the books. I've got 40 of it. And mind you, it's one notebook per year. So you can imagine I've got like 40 years worth of knowledge in a 10 year span because I just went writing and writing and writing and writing and I'm capturing moments of experience that could help me and boost my career boost my confidence, boost my articulation, boost the way I view myself through other people that I'm talking to and how they experience me as a professional, me being a leader, but being a professional. If I'm sitting in front of a CEO, I need to be able to deliver the same message I'm able to deliver to my boss in the same tone, in the same attitude, 
you know, go to your boss, you're a bit brave, right? You're like, this is what I don't like about what I had to do. Boom, 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 boom. You go and stay in front of the CEO. You're like, 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 a boss. no, you need to be able to have the same energy and be able to be open enough to express yourself. But I think what works for me is my character. You find what works for you and you, you drive it with your character. And for me, that was an integral part of me being successful and, and being open to change was a very integral part of my success in my career right now. Thank you, Tasha. I think it's important when we talk about um, growing yourself and developing as women leaders, it's really twofold. Yes, it's skill. One of my pet peeves is when people say, I don't know how. Well, none of us know how until we do know how. Like, I don't know how is not a reason to not do something. It's a reason to go learn something. But as women leaders, so much of our growth is our personal growth. So much of who we are is recognizing actual things in yourself that you want to develop, embrace, or change. So for my journey, like if you went and talked to Melissa 20 years ago, in her cocky mouthy self. Um, that was actually a lot of defense mechanism showing that to Melissa now that I tend to put empathy forward, listen before I speak, which was very hard for me to do. Melissa 20 years from ago, didn't know how to just hush and listen. Not that you should hush, but sometimes you need to hear before you react. But I think that's been my development and my personal growth. Learn the skills I don't have when they come up, oh, like we, when I started in contact center, it was inbound. And then I learned outbound. And then I learned back office. Now it's the trifecta of different contact methods. And now there's, you know, bots or agents. So learn the skill, but most importantly, learn yourself because you will never be a successful leader if you're mirroring and you're not embracing who you are. So that's how has been my development journey. Um, this, can so, I take the so second part of that one-liner, Melissa? I just got a one-liner on this. Just push yourself yeah. outside your comfort zone, too. If you want to continue your development and growth as a leader, you have to be willing. And it, it's hard. A lot of you have probably started as, like, deep sneeze in a WFM or a planning space. Jump to technology. I, I just took a jump over to retail. I have no business in retail. I don't walk into a bank, right? But like, you got to go over, you got to push yourself into a place where you are not the expert, but that your skills are transferable. And that is part of how I continue my growth and development as a leader in my later career where I don't want to, you know, and I'm in a bank. There's only so niche you can go with workforce management, right? So pushing yourself uh, to move around a little bit so that you can continue to grow your, your, your skill set and apply them in new spaces with new people. Aida, did you have an add on this as well? Yeah, I think the second part of that question was how do you maintain your consistency and your principles? Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to take that one. And I think the two of them are, are wrapped up together because your principles are how you maintain your consistency. Um, I mean, a lot of things will change over your life as you develop your views on things, your opinions on things. If you never change your opinions on things, then you've got a problem, right? Because you're not taking new knowledge on board. But I think in general, your cons your principles, the guiding principles of your life should remain consistent and you should bring those to work. And that, I think, is how you maintain consistency. And we're all working in very dynamic environments in a very challenging macroeconomic environment at the moment. And we may be asked to do things that are difficult, to do things that are challenging, to look at things differently. And I think it's really important that in that kind of environment, you don't lose sight of your principles and that your principles are what make you stand back and look and say, OK, how can I if I can't hands on directly control the situation, how can I influence it to get a positive outcome for the business, for my team, for myself? Because if you if you go away from your principles, you're lost. You have no course. And I think that the principles are how you maintain consistency through changing environments, through changing roles and really looking at how they guide you to influence things for a positive outcome. That's a great point. I, I, I feel that really touches on who we are as people versus who we are at work. And how do we make 
sure are connected. So what I'd like to do um, as we come to our closing, though we have a while, I want to I want to hear from each of you again as you reflect on this time here today. I'm going to answer the, the we have another question on the panel. But as I answer that, I want to go back around again and just reflection on this journey of how we've navigated from where we were as women leaders, wherever you and your career started or who came before you and where you are now. And what would be that one piece of advice for any leaders of obviously we have both men and women listen to us today of what they can take from this conversation before I close out. I'll answer this question, then come around and then close out with all of you. Um, my question is based on your experiences and how the WFM has been developing, what should we expect from the future and how can we be prepared? Like it's, it's a great question coming off the last question, I think is, you know, for me, preparing is all about knowing who you are and what you do. Like we're leaders. We don't know when it comes to WFM, if that's your space, obviously the technology is going to advance quickly, but it's not about preparing for the technology, the technology you will learn but you still have to know what it means. You have to know the fundamentals. And I think so many new people are coming into this career path and they just know that what the button tells them, right? They don't know what actually drives a frontline agent about, they don't know what drives a customer to call. They're not thinking about those connection points. So for me, workforce management is still about being the connection point, being the point where all things come together the two contacts, the contact center part, the financials, the operation, the HR work, the people, it's the human approach. And so we manage human interaction. We don't manage numbers. So I think whatever comes ahead in our career, we have to remember that it all ties together a human interaction. Even if it's a bot on one side, there's a human connection point. That's why we're contact center. Someone has tried to make contact with an organization and we're there to make sure it happens in the best way possible. Um, so with that, I would like to kind of go back around the room and just have your closing and so appreciative. And then I'll close out, but let me start. Uh, I'm going to start backwards from how I started. So I'm going to start with Francia. I'd love to hear about, you know, as a closing point to this, what you would like to be a takeaway for the leaders listening today. Sure, I'll keep it simple. Um, let's keep inspiring each other, lifting each other up, and working towards a future where every woman feels empowered to reach her full potential. And as women, we should also uplift other women uh, to succeed together with, you know, together with our male allies whenever and wherever possible. Thank you. Thank you, Francia. Catherine? Yes, thank you. It's been for me a fantastic session, to be honest. And the, the mix of uh, journeys, personalities, locations, educations um, convinced me that wherever we sit, whatever is our journey, in the end, we are all going through the same challenges still the same experiences and um, we that's the the beauty of this community of uh, leaders is that we can always share in a safe environment open and transparent uh, environment and that's what I really appreciate more it's not about playing a role when we come all together, it's speaking the truth and sharing um, what is difficult and, and what we enjoy doing. And that's that's really what I enjoy as part of this uh, community. So thank you. Thank you for that. If there is one thing that I would like to share um, today to conclude is that personally, when I look backwards, um, I realized that I never had a plan. I never thought about building a career, being powerful at some point, being an influencing woman at some point. I never, never 
so this way. But I always took an opportunity and I always made choices based on my convictions, my guiding principles, my values, and the challenge that was offered to me. And it's okay to accept that it's not an ongoing rising curve where you believe that you are going to get promoted every year, every two years, and and become, you know, uh, at the top of the organization at some point. I think that it's also okay to acknowledge that there are some periods in your life that things can slow down. You can have the impression that you stay with the same role and still learning, and that's completely fine. Life is a journey, right? And... Um, it's not a destination. And I think that that's what has guided me in the past 20, 30 years. My life is a journey. It's not a destination. I don't know what the destination is, and that's perfectly fine. Thank you, Catherine. That's some great advice. Sue? Um, I think the key messages um, and, and if the words that I've heard quite a lot in the last hour is courage. Um, and one of the things that I think we, um, as we come together and as a, as a collective in, in, in this industry and as, as women, I think what, what you know, the power of numbers really gives people more confidence and more courage to move forward in leadership. Um, and I'd hope that in the next five years, we see, see more and more women coming through the industry and, 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 and making a re real difference. So I think that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, consistently approach with my team and the girls that are coming through and I'm trying to mentor and sponsor. Now I'm going to start using sponsor as well. Um, it's absolutely, is, is one of the things is have courage, step up and you you deserve to be at the table. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sue. Aida? Um, I'd like to, just maybe following on from the, the point I made earlier about principles and beliefs, I'd like to to finish with two beliefs that I hold very strongly. One is that for women to continue to succeed in leadership and be nurtured and empowered in leadership, I think the way men are managed and led is as important as the way women are managed, managed and led. Because one of the things that I'm seeing in recent years that I think is a complete game changer is that men, particularly young men, can take paternity leave and say, I have to leave early today because I'm collecting my kids from school. I am, no, I can't make that because I have a family commitment. I'm doing something with my children. Um, I think that has leveled the playing field and it's to be encouraged and applauded, both from the point of view of those men who are making those decisions um, and the leaders who are facilitating them. So that, that's one of the things. And, and the other thing is coming back a little bit to, to what Catherine said. My message to women would be, it's your life, it's your choice. There is no blueprint that you have to follow. So you can be like Tash, you can be a young, a young mother and have a phenomenal career at 28. That's a brave choice. It's not for everybody. You can choose to have a career and have children. You can choose to have a career and not have children because it's not for you. You can choose to have children and decide a career isn't for you. You can change your mind at any time. There's no blueprint. So, and I think it's really important in these conversations in women's forums that we include all women and all their choices and whatever form their leadership takes. So it's all about empowering women to make the choices for them not any specific choice that society might think is more valuable than another choice. Excellent, Aida. Thank you so much. Tasha? I'm going to keep it short and sweet. For all our beautiful and aspiring analysts, both male and female, 
The only thing I will say is don't allow others to create boundaries and bring up walls for you. Break them down. Own, own yourself. Own what you want and go and get it. Shine. Be beautiful while you're doing it. And don't let anyone stop you. Be determined and just go with it. Even when it feels like it's all coming down on you, go with it. Stick to your guns, like you said, and go and just roll with the punches. Because after every chaotic, stormy season that you go through, there's something beautiful at the end of it. Thank you so much, Tasha. Vanessa? Oh, today has uh, you know, been such a, a wonderful event. I love the, the wide spectrum uh, of experience and career placement and energy. Uh, you know, I, 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 Tasha, you know, you've got that deep, deep 100% throttle energy that like, I, I remember it well. I'm exhausted even just looking at it now. You know, uh, Catherine Aida, like, so like, you know, a little bit of that quiet comfort and peace that comes with a little bit of, uh, of a, a journey behind you. And, you know, actually sometimes the, the courage that comes from that of, of knowing just because you can doesn't mean you should. So, you know, take a little bit of a ebb and flow in a career journey and, and sort of being able to, to move fluidly between um, the different levels of uh, prioritization that you put in your personal and your uh, and your professional life. And, uh, you know, knowing that you can't always give 150% everywhere, right? Like, and, and being able to move with peace and confidence and um Aida, I was also particularly struck just by what you just said about how our, our coaching and our growth, you know, it's also to the young men in our, our lives as employees. Um, I have three sons, you know, raising them to, you know, take the parental leaves. And, you know, I, I was thinking about it and I've got a, a bunch of young men with young kids on my team right now and I am helping them navigate to that it's okay to go to the school play, you know, it's okay. Your wife's got a really big, important meeting today. Support her, we can manage, you know, um, and, and sort of breaking down some of those, um, those lines of conversation that are, you know, oh, this is a women's issue or, or whatnot. It really is about that inclusivity with our allies and, and sort of uh, normalizing that conversation in all parts. Uh, be it our be it our young boys in our lives, or our young men on our teams, or perhaps even that senior leader who, who you know might be stodgy in, in ways and need to be challenged directly um, from you know somebody that they trust in a, in a place of you know positive challenge. So fantastic uh, work today, Melissa. I, I think you know your your ability to sort of tie each of us together and and to sort of help uh, us build on each other's stories. Um, no, again, it, it was a fantastic spectrum. And, you know, again, if I leave then anybody with everything, with anything, I would say just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, a lesson that, I, you know, it's probably been many decades in the, in the making for me. But, um, you know, having the support and leveraging a diverse group of people around you, you know, you'll, you'll be surprised at where you may end up, even if it, it is without specific intention. Thank you, Vanessa. Pretty powerful words. And where I'd like to take us back to is, you know, back to where we started, that journey that's been forged ahead of us, right? So there were a group of women that came before all of us that really empowered us to be on our journey. And then again, we might not have intended to do so, but now we have forged a path for the next generation of leaders. And I think that, you know, the tide has turned in our society when they look at male and female roles. And one of the things I always challenge people is to me, and we talked a little bit before the call launched, that true feminism isn't about equality for women. It's about equality overall, that all people have the same ability, um, the same way to be heard, the same seat at the table, to, be, to ask a question and have the person look at you when they answer to be seen, to be understood. That is the desire of all humans. And I'm so appreciative that when we all take time to come together here on a Friday afternoon or morning, wherever you are, that to sit for a moment and just talk about the journey that we've all had to encourage each other and to recognize the voices and the stories that we have. So um, I'm gonna end in a moment and I'll, I'm gonna play some of the favorite music of the panel here. But I want to read something, um, just a little expert, expert, excerpt 
from what it's meant to me when I first recognized what it meant to what equality truly meant. And it's a, it's a little book that I keep on my nightstand. I've read so many times. I almost read the whole thing this morning, just looking for a quote. It's um, we should all be feminists and, and I'll read this quote for everyone. And this is where I would like to end it. I would, I would like to ask that we begin to dream about, dream about and plan for a different world, a fairer world, a world of happier men and happier women who are truer to themselves. And this is how to start. We must raise our daughters differently and we must raise our sons differently. So to me, that's a very powerful statement of it's not about women. It's not about men. It's about how we all are happier together. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. I will hand it back over to you. We so appreciate these opportunities that you give us to come together. And we recognize what GWFM does for the entire world. Um, so back to you. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Harald has raised his hand, you know, you may want to ask a question and we'll allow him to talk. Harald, do you have a question? Hello, hello. Um, I am Harold Perez uh, from Support Services Group in the Dominican Republic. I just had a comment um, about um, this call and I just wanted to um, share how much I've been influenced by some awesome women leaders in the workforce management scene um, Kimberly McCannum and Erica Gurr have been absolutely, absolute game changers for me. Um, Kimberly's insights as a VP of workforce management have opened up so many doors and expanded my horizons big time. Um, Erica Gurr, uh, with over a decade of expertise as well, has been a fear and a major source of inspiration, um, fueling my passion for WFM as my future career path. And now Melissa. Uh, that with her longtime expertise, she has helped me develop in the last couple of months, right? um, get out of my comfort zone, embrace my opinion. For example, I made a comment recently like, oh, I hope that this opinion won't get me fired. And it's like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm not going to fire you. Like, no worries. Like, just, just speak your mind, right? I'm 25 years old, so I can relate a lot to um, Tasha, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a Gen Z, so I will al always um, speak my mind. Um, plus, also, I got to give props to my mom, who is the director of quality and compliance at a, a, one of the a, one of re, a new university here in the Dominican Republic. Uh, her leadership has taught me uh, so much about what it means to be a manager. Right now, I'm a senior workforce manager here at Support Services Group. Um, and again, as, as a man, I have learned from powerful women. And I truly believe that empowering um, women in leadership roles um, is the key to make workplaces not only diverse, but also um, better for everyone. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Um, we have uh, Lauren has raised her hand. Around. Let's hear from him. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So um, I just want to say I'm so inspired like i am booming with the joy listening to everything i think i'm the most reaction person on this entire <laughs> entire forum but i just also wanted to share a bit of a story which i'll make it quick and um since i joined the call center world all my leaders for a number of the years were males and i learned a lot of them i learned how to you know, deal with things confidently and, you know, interact with certain things, a lot of soft skills. And there was one time where I was brave enough to go to someone I didn't have a very good experience with. And this person and I, you know, just had an unfortunate clash in our career. And um, it was tough because I was like, oh, you know, I'm not going to get hired. That, that was thinking I was going for an interview and, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I'm not going to get hired. And, um, you know, we had a bad experience. They wouldn't see my growth. And then I go to this this interview and um, this person interviews me and she says to me like, Lauren, wow, 
this is a completely different person I know since four years ago. And um, I'm so proud of you. And I was shocked because I experienced Lent with us not even communicating, you know, um, with each other since then. And it's proud to, I'm proud to call her my leader now, Tash. You know I'm talking about you. I'm proud to call her my leader now. We've been together for the last four years. And it takes a very good and great person and an even greater leader to identify someone's growth after the experience. And it was, it's such an overwhelming thing. She's given me multiple opportunities. You know, I've... Um, you know, been a finalist in one of our Papesa Awards because of her recommendations for me. She's taken every bad impression she had about me. And she said, you know what, that was the past and this is your future and this is what you're going to be. And um, I hold her very close to my heart as a leader, but I, I carry her as a professional um, sort of trophy that I look at. So, Tash, I just want to say I appreciate you and thank you for every single thing you always do for me in terms of my career. Thanks, Vivek. Humble LP. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more person. I think I will take this as the last one, Um Yeah. Tabil. Tabil has... Uh, yeah. Tabil, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Tube Lisa here. Hi. Everyone calls me Tube. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not in workforce. Um, I'm actually in recruitment, but Tosh is a leader in our business um, at Cura. Um, I've learned so much. It was not a, a industry-specific um, sort of um, talk, and I appreciate that. Um, as a young woman um, in, in the industry or within the corporate space, I appreciate everything that I've learned. Thank you for coming together. I'm hoping to, you know, sort of jump on, on so much more. But thank you so much, Vanessa, for touching on something so important, which um, I think I've, I've really carried out from this um, meeting, and that is the the active sponsoring not just being mentors but actually opening doors actively you know mentioning people in the right spaces and and i think it's it's completely opened up my eyes to what mentorship can truly be um in any sort of professional space and i really did take i mean i took down notes <laughs> i thought i was just here to listen but i took down notes to, i've really learned a lot so thank you so much um yeah i think my favorite speakers, I don't know if that even matters, but, you know, Tasha, Ada, Vanessa, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I took so much notes and, um, yeah, hoping to sort of jump on onto so many more um, talks of this nature. Thank you. Thank you, Papa. So uh, it's really uh, been just more than inspired. I have been really inspired a lot by all the uh, uh, you know, panelists. Melissa, you have uh, done a fantastic moderation and with thought provoking questions to everyone. And, and uh, I really learned a lot. And uh, I, I, I saw very good questions, you know, still some more questions are going to come up. However, you know, like we're going to stop this now here and uh, want to express deepest gratitude to Melissa. Melissa has been inspirational and one of the powerful WF leaders in the global uh, industries. And uh, every time that I listen to her, I really learn a lot, something new. And uh, thanks. And I express deepest gratitude to all the amazing panelists, Vanessa, Tasha, uh, Catherine, Haida, Francia, and uh, Sue. In a short notice, you know, you all uh, uh, were able to make it with uh, leaving all your work and uh, making this Friday fantastic and uh, really contributed a lot in terms of, you know, like sharing your thoughts and experiences. And it has been a phenomenal learning for me. And uh, so I, I saw that around 15, 20 of them are watching on our LinkedIn Live. And this is going to be made available on our uh, YouTube channel for the benefit of many of them. In fact, you know, like uh, our next magazine is going to cover up all, uh, you know, the cover page is going to come with all your, uh, all the speakers' pictures. But also in interactions, how, how you know, it has really taken. We want to make this reaching to thousands worldwide. And uh, GWFM is a forum where we want to get all the leaders across the world. You know, we, we exist everywhere. We encourage every leader in every part of the country 
we are there everywhere. So it has been a phenomenal support from each one of you. Really, thank you for taking your time out to uh, share your thoughts and uh, insights. It really means a lot. WFM is really growing industry. And uh, before before I move on, uh, you know, to conclude, I thought I'll just uh, share, you know, like few uh, comments that I thought I'll make where uh, uh, we have uh, an event coming up in Colombia. Uh, any of you like to be traveling here as a speaker or as an audience, you know, and if you have any of your team members over there, please ask them to you know, nominate and register over here for this event. This is our second edition, which is going to take place here. This is one. And the second thing that uh, we have a uh, WPM Innovation uh, Acton, you know, which is going to happen. This is our uh, fourth edition. Uh, so far, we have got around we have got around 70 to 80 business cases. We published three books. And Melissa has been one of the judges and uh, even Venice also in the uh, you know previous years. We want your organization and your team to participate and let's come and you know, bring in new innovation, new problems with the new solutions. We encourage all of you to participate. If you want any questions, I mean, if you have any questions or if you have any clarification, feel free to reach out to us, reach out to me. Happy to have, you know, fourth edition is going to be much, much more uh, innovative WFM solutions. With this, I thank all the uh, eminent speakers and Melissa, so special gratitude to you for taking your time out and uh, and and uh, that you have taken uh, time to you know drafting and uh, bringing the context to uh, share your insight to entire world. You, you inspired inspired me and inspired everyone. We would want to have future of the events and all. We'll continue to inspire you know, worldwide. WFM and also industry professionals. With this, thank you so much and uh, truly privileged to host this women uh, leadership event. Thank you. If any of you have anything, you know, feel free to share. With this, you know, we can uh, close the session. Yeah, thank you so much, Melissa and Shiva for having us. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure to be hosted and share our love and passion for um, WFM, but also our people leadership. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Well, have been uh, incredible learning and uh, wonderful session. Thoroughly enjoyed. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.